Dr. Preeti Nair, the honored principal of the college, Dr. Ranjana Shankar, Dr. Manju T, the IQAZ coordinator, uh, Srimadi Kairali KK, Dr. Rakesh Ramamurthy, my co-speaker on the panel, uh, teachers of the college, research scholars, students, and other guests. <clears throat> Let me be honest. I try to get away from this as much as possible. Uh, <clears throat> as is my wound, I've been trying to avoid public functions as much as possible, given uh, the kind of work that I'm involved in right now, which does not really permit me to either read, let alone write, and secondly, because in my position it has become a kind of ritual to be invited for inaugurations. And after a while, <clears throat> I'm not sure about the others who are listening to me, but personally, I get pretty irritated with my own words, which is the repetition of the same thing. So honestly, I tried to wriggle out of this, but Dr. Anjana Shankar would have none of it. <clears throat> she kept on calling me, <clears throat> threatening to come and meet me. I tried to persuade her that it is not necessary, but she will again not listen to me. And she came with all the strength of a couple of other faculty members with her, and I was browbeaten into accepting this. <clears throat> not that I regretted any seeing this audience. It's definitely an honor to be invited to an institution of this stature with a history of several decades and great contributions to academics and intellectual life in the state, and which has a long line of extremely reputed teachers, not just in English, in several areas, probably the most important being mathematics, which is a forte of this college, which is a forte of this entire locality, I should say, this entire area. So it's definitely a privilege, a great honor to be here, and I thank you for inviting me, even though I've been browbeaten into doing that. <clears throat> now, uh, cultural studies is the topic of the discussion today and tomorrow. And from the brochure, I understand that there are extremely interesting uh, topics being discussed, and I find it even more uh, impressive that the organizers of the seminar have tried to call younger scholars, not old foggies like me, and that is the way to go, because especially with cultural studies, it's a young discipline. It's a young discipline, not just in terms of the youth, the small, short number of years that it has been uh, amongst us, but it's also a young discipline because it has come from or on the part of younger scholars who were disinterested in the kind of orthodox scholarship that was being uh, adhered to by the older professors and because they wanted to bring in new questions new problems, new kinds of areas of study, new kinds of areas of life to academics, which till that point of time, or even now, is, was considered anathema for academics. So cultural studies is definitely a young area of study, and it is befitting, most befitting, that you have people like Rakesh who has worked on cricketing cultures and postcoloniality, and Sucheta, whose work on travel writing is very impressive, and of course, Saji, whom I wouldn't 
uh, probably call very young, but still younger than me. So definitely that's the way to go. And I believe most of the papers that are going to be presented here uh, the next two days are also probably more from the younger side of people. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, when we say this, and when we say cultural studies is a young discipline, what are its challenges now is a question that I wanted to discuss. Again, let me be honest. As is my wont, I gave a title first, and then I thought I'll think about it later. Uh, usually, in earlier instances, I get time, two or three days, to think about it. In this instance, I really didn't get much time, uh, given certain other circumstances. So I'm sorry you will have to probably bear with my stream of consciousness. Uh, especially because uh, the ideas that are going to come are probably ideas that are to do with my imminent response or imminent response to being within an area, trying to further it in terms of our locality, of our questions, fighting with tendencies inside that, struggling with them, disagreeing with certain kinds of tendencies that are there, agreeing with some, etc., all of which are possible for its cultural studies. <clears throat> now, as has been indicated here by the principal, cultural studies is a rich arena, rich arena in every sense of the term. Cultural studies has a variety, a myriad of locations, locutions. It addresses several kinds of mappings, geographies. It addresses several kinds of histories. It addresses several kinds of aspects of human life in terms of culture. And it employs what one would call a number of very disparate kind of approaches for these studies. For example, a cultural studies scholar like Rakesh would work on the culture of cricket. Someone else may work on the culture of film songs. A third person may work on the game of chess and the social implications of that. A fourth person may actually look at the way in which contemporary fashion designs have very clear gendered designs behind them, and so on and so forth. In fact, the possibilities of cultural studies are indeed limitless, so to speak just as human life or human experience is limitless. And on the other hand, you also find that the way in which these myriad areas of life are addressed, they are also not limited to a few theoretical positions or a few methodologies, but employ and draw from a very large array of theoretical formulations of conceptual matrices and seem to actually indicate that cultural studies can never be reduced into a singularity. If you look at history, for example, or sociology, for example, or anthropology, for example, there is a coherence in those disciplines. Or physics or chemistry, for that matter, there is a coherence in those disciplines whereby it will be possible for you to describe and define what constitutes the fundamental nature of that discipline in terms of the objects of study, in terms of the methods of study, in terms of the objectives of study or the purposes of study. Ask a chemistry person. She will probably be very clear about what her research area is in terms of the particular objectives, the particular uh, shall we say, material that is taken and the methodologies that are employed. Ask another person in chemistry, you will find that the objectives and the objects may differ, but the methodology seems to be rather similar, or if not similar, corresponding. But when it comes to cultural studies, such a coherence is absent. And that is exactly why, because it is host to a number of a hundreds of theoretical formulations, methodologies, approaches, etc. That is why it is not possible to call it 
a singular discipline but a multiple discipline and why it may probably be questionable even to use the term discipline itself. In a certain sense of the term, it is quite anti-discipline too. Precisely because in its inception, especially in the United Kingdom and later on in the United States, even though its stirrings came from Europe, cultural studies was a great struggle against the established methods of academia in terms of disciplinary divides. One basic question that came up for universities in Britain especially was that by the 19th century, end of the 19th century, the study of literature had acquired, had been introduced, and slowly it had acquired a kind of methodology, both pedagogically as well as research-wise, which attempted to re-replicate in terms of the humanities the methodologies of sciences and social sciences by clearly defining what its objects are, what its approaches are, what kinds of theoretical formulations are to be used, etc., etc. But after a while, when the universities in Britain started opening their portals to a body of bodies of students which were radically different from the conventional shall we say, demographic profile of the 19th century student, especially by inviting and accepting, number one, women who were never there in universities for, till the 90, end of 19th century, people from lower income backgrounds, people from lower classes, people from the suburbs, and then even further still, people from communities such as the blacks, the non-whites, different kinds of nationalities, etc. Academics within the universities started facing huge conflicts. Huge conflicts in the sense, one of the major reasons that English literature was introduced, as most of you would know, into the university education was an average shall we say, Londoner, a woman who comes into the university and asks to learn Latin, she would naturally ask a question, what has got Latin to do with me? What has got it got to do with my life? How is it going to contribute in any manner to my life? Or how can I contribute to Latin? And these questions became more and more persistent, so much so that the universities had to relook at their own curricula, at their own syllabi, at the very subjects that were being offered. That was why English literature came to be taught in the first instance, but the same questions came to be asked of English literature too. What do you mean by English literature? Is English literature the rit literature written in English? Then what about the literatures written in the colonial, colonized countries? What about the literature written by Welsh and Cornish and Scottish writers? What about the songs being written or orally transmitted generation to generation by the farming public of Wales? Isn't that literature? So effectively, I'm putting it in a very simple fashion. <clears throat> effectively, the idea of the canon, of literature of, as something that is constituted something that is defined in terms of a certain amorphous nature of quality, a certain value judgment which is reserved only to certain professors residing in ivory towers or in places called Oxford or Cambridge. This whole idea came to be questioned. And again, naturally indeed, the discourses, the kind of, shall we say, locutions mm -hmm that were part of the life of so many other people, so many other communities, which never found a place within the university, had to be introduced into the university. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> In that sense, <clears throat> the slow development of cultural studies from the 1940s, 50s onwards, or the impulses for that from the 1940s, 50s, and the actual formation of cultural studies by the 1970s, 80s, were primarily motivated by a sense of inclusion, 
an idea of including not just the elite or the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants alone, but a number of communities, a number of life worlds, a number of experiences which belong to people other than the small minority of people who were considered to be the holders, the possessors of culture. We find something very similar happening and already having happened in India, in Kerala. In the Irunu Malayala Sahitim in the Jodichal, Malayala Yatavara Dulillo. In the Irunu Malayala Sahitim in the Jodichal, Malayala Sahitim Urpurtege Idil Matram Nurneke Petanilkagim. A Malayala Sahitinde, Provisia Kagata, Swigarikan, Karia the Niruna, Anegam Samudangal Dame, Anegam Bhashan a Rubangal Dame, Vyavahari the Madrigal Dame, Oke. Ah, Thalatil in the Lachodiangal Uneke Petapurana, the Lida Sahitium, Mapilla Sahitium, either a Dedigal La Sahitium, Adinagati Provisic in the Is that a problem? That's okay, I find it. It's okay. Don't worry. Um, Kalidi has given me an allergy which doesn't seem to leave me. Probably. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm hoping <coughs> that <coughs> I'm hoping that the Chancellor will be kind enough and give me a respite. Okay. There is always optimism. Uh, one always has to hope. So anyway. Uh, e Kerala Tal Tane, Endana Sahitim and the Nurnaetene, Vibuligericha, Uruprotega Pradipa Sounder. Other Yan Nerete, E. Britenda Guidim, Paranjabole, Tane, Ibadanadana, Urikaidiman. But what effectively defined cultural studies was also the realization that one cannot just limit one's understanding of human expression to just some formal modes of expression, say literature or performance or art, or expressive models which are canonically understood to be, established to be expressions. And that is where cultural studies brought in its greatest impact in making people realize that effectively speaking, in everything that we do, in everything that we speak, in every action that we are engaged in, whether consciously or unconsciously, we are continuously producing meanings. When I have a certain gesture, when I move in a certain manner, when I sit in a certain manner, even though I may not be aware of it, I'm communicating something about me and my relationship with the world, my relationship with the others sitting next to me or sitting around me or people who are not in the vicinity. I may not be aware of what I'm communicating, but that communication does communicate to the others. They may be receiving it, probably unconsciously, probably consciously or semi-consciously, but this untold communication that seems to be taking place <clears throat> among people, unspoken communication which seems to be taken pla taking place among people, which seems to go beyond the province of language or specified language, and which situate people and their discourses in certain social dramas Dramas of connections, dramas of relationships, dramas of hierarchies, dramas ultimately of power. This was what cultural studies really attempted to grapple with. Literature <clears throat> did not have space for that. Neither did the conventional disciplines for that matter. How can something like black music be understood? Can it be understood purely in terms of its lyrics? 
Can it be understood purely in terms of the particular music patterns that are employed? Jazz, for that matter. What is the politics of jazz? What is the social, uh, shall we say, context and social communicative load of jazz? How do you understand it to actually, how do you, how do you conceive why it seems to have such an appeal at that particular point of time when jazz was introduced, or jazz came to be a huge, celebrated musical avenue, why did it turn out to be so? Why does a certain trend of fashion come to be accepted in a, in a majority way? What are those particular elements of semiosis that seems to actually work within these discourses? which defines not only that particular discourse itself, but the person or persons who are involved in that discourse. Now, this just opened up the entire possibility. This meant that it was not possible anymore to limit ourselves to the written text and the reading of the written text. It became necessary for us to look at all kinds of texts. If everything is making meaning, producing meaning, it basically means that everything that we confront is a text. The fact that a girl here is dressing in a certain fashion and another girl is dressing in another fashion, they are texts. They are cortex. They are texts which clearly indicate a social relationship as well as their situation within a particular society and the dialectics, the social dialectics within that and the power relationships there. How do we read those texts? What do we understand of social fabric and social power relations in the context in terms of this? All these became extremely crucial. What cultural studies effectively told us, and this is very important, is that none of our actions, none of our utterances are entirely innocent. They are never innocent. Even though consciously we may consider my, ourselves to be innocent of what we have said, in reality, we are implicating ourselves in every action, with every action, in a certain kind of cultural modality whereby our identity is revealed, our identity, not only our identity, our relationships are revealed, our positions are revealed, our proclivities are revealed. This is where cultural studies became very political in nature. And it is not political in terms of the apparent understanding of the term political, but it is political in a very, very fundamental sense, in the sense of trying to understand how power works within society, how power courses through society, how power is manifest in practically every little niche of social interaction. Naturally, this is very important. And that is why we find cultural studies becoming very critical, so to speak. Because cultural studies as politics is not an affirmative kind of politics. Cultural studies politics is definitely a resistant kind of politics. It's a politics which looks askance at every utterance which seems to be affirmative of the status quo of the way in which society functions itself and normates itself. It is questioning of the very idea of normativity, of normalcy, so to speak. And where, when everything is being questioned in such a fashion, what it brings out are methods of reading, reading as probably Walter Benjamin puts it, brushing a wood against the grain it reads texts against themselves so that the text can throw up, can bring out ideas that it itself probably never was aware it held at one point of time. Now, this was the original or the earlier impulses of cultural studies. And right now, what has happened all through in the Western world, and once it came into our own world, what has happened is that, on the one hand, this explosion or this exponential expansion 
of the possibilities of study and research has happened here too. It would have been inconceivable for Rakesh if he had lived in the 1970s to think of a work of research doing a PhD on cricket. He would have been shown the door by Dr. Ayyappa Panikar and said, you probably should do something else. Uh, or, I'm not, he was, he's, he's a very revered teacher, but I'm just saying. Even during my time, when I started doing my PhD, and I wanted to work on a particular area, which I later on did try to work independently, to do with theater as a form of expression which cannot be limited to a form, I was very strongly dissuaded from that. There were clear boundaries. Let's not call them boundaries. There were clear walls. You couldn't cross them. You couldn't go across them. But right now, students are coming up with unbelievably inventive ideas. They are coming up with areas which probably never occurred to a scholar 30 or 40 or 50 years back. They are coming up with ideas not only of what to do, but how to do it in manners which are very innovative. I'm not trying to say that all of them are good. I'm trying to say that there is a huge exponential growth in the possibilities of research, in the possibilities of study, which otherwise was not there. And this has affected not just English, it has affected practically or influenced practically all the language disciplines. It has affected humanities, the social sciences, history, sociology. The cultural studies turn has indeed become probably one of the most, shall we say, uh, crucial uh, bends that have happened within academia in the last 50 to 60 years, influencing not only the nomenclatures of departments, not only the work uh, in terms of conferences and research papers, but also the very curriculum and syllabi of different departments to such an extent that they become unrecognizable when you compare it with the syllabi and curriculum of 20 or 30 years back. Yes, cultural studies has indeed made its impact. But it may be worthwhile for us to look at it again, as any cultural studies scholar should do, to look at cultural studies itself from the perspective of cultural studies. If cultural studies has originally and throughout been interested in the question of power, in the questions of canonization, in the questions of how certain kind of discourses, certain kinds of locutions are given privilege and positioned as if higher to the others, cultural studies should itself probably be interrogated whether cultural studies has become implicated in the very systems of which it was resistant to. The reason I say this, that here <clears throat> is because of this. And from my experience as a research supervisor and looking at quite a few students here, this is not a very important thing, but an important thing. And research scholars here, cultural studies has become very fashionable. It's become very fashionable. And precisely because of that, people like me have become very critical of cultural studies. I was introduced as one of the pioneers of cultural studies. I'm not very sure whether I want to be called so right now, honestly. I mean, I don't want to be a pioneer of anything for that matter. Uh, I'd like to be outside any such labels. But yes, I agree, I accept with Dr. T.K. Ramachandran and along with him, it was I, or I should say it's the other way around. Uh, Dr. T.K. Ramachandran with me uh, was instrumental in introducing the idea of cultural studies in Kerala Academia. The first conference on cultural studies, which was visitations of the past, which I shall come back to later, was held in Calicut University. The first set of articles on cultural studies were published by the English Department of uh, Calicut University. The very idea of cultural studies came to be, uh, if not propagated, at least spread 
within uh, scholarship in English and Malayalam from that point onwards. So, yes, I'm guilty as charged. And I'll tell you why I'm saying I'm guilty as charged. I'm not very proud of that right now. And the reason I'm not very proud is because of two reasons which I shall come to, and that's the present challenge of cultural studies. Cultural studies has become, because of its immense possibilities, because of its very fashionable, the fashionable terrains that it offers people, to come up with very innovative ideas, to come up with innovative objects of work. And because of these innovative objects of work, it gives students the possibility of doing something which she or he may think has never been done before, which is definitely there. But what about it is a question. How are you doing this? Does it merely just matter that if I were to work on the cafe culture of Fort Kuchin as probably a matter of cultural studies? Yes, it's a worthwhile subject, no doubt about that. Is it the innovativeness, the inventiveness of a topic which compels you to accept that? Or is there something to do with the approach that you're actually employing there? Is there a particular kind of compelling nature about the theoretical formulations that you're using? Is it intended to bring about or bring out the underlying tensions among communities probably, among ways of life probably, among different forms of power structures which are changing, as Williams would call it, emergent structures of power, emergent structures of understanding. But ultimately, there is another question. How does it really contribute to our understanding of our own life? Cultural studies, ultimately speaking, was not merely an academic discipline. Cultural studies was very intent upon bridging the gap between academia and life in bridging the gap between intellect and practice, in bridging the gap between manifest and immanent knowledge in such a way that these knowledges would ultimately be helpful to people at large, not merely within the universities in terms of getting PhDs and tenured positions and being called professors, but much more than that, to actually aid and contribute to the understanding of life in such a manner that the lives of people could be bettered, the quality of their lives could be bettered through critical understanding of the special conditions in which they find themselves to be oppressed, they find themselves to be excluded, they find themselves to be, shall I say, unable to realize their human potential. This is the ultimate political goal of cultural studies. It is not what one would call literature for literature, or art for art, or criticism for criticism. The ultimate politics of cultural studies lies in the fact that it was directed towards an understanding of human practice and human uh, discourse in such a manner as to unravel the hidden structures of power the hidden conditions of hierarchy that are present within our very modes of living so that through that unraveling, it may be possible for us to realize where we stand, correct ourselves, and bring about the formation of a more humane society. Look at feminism, for example. What is feminism ultimately directed at? Feminism is ultimately directed at the way in which gender is used as power, the way in which gender constructs, gender determinations, gender attitudes clearly institute a kind of hierarchy among the genders, not the sexes, among the genders, and where there are certain structures of hidden exclusion whereby, as they call, there is a glass ceiling for women and for genders that are non-male, so to speak. The critique that we saw coming up from feminism throughout, from its first phase to its second phase, then its third phase, and then ultimately in its opening up 
into the myriad possibilities of different genders, gender as a rainbow, the idea of gender critique was ultimately not directed purely at the critique of texts, at the critique of discourses. It was intended at transforming lives, at transforming social life. Look at Dalit literature, or Dalit writing, or Dalit critique. Same is the case. Look at the different forms of class critique that you had in the West. Same is the case. In fact, when the principle here mentioned about identities, almost all those different, uh, shall we say, uh, discourses that are part of critical discourses that are part of subaltern identities, in one way or another, they addressed, let's be clear about it, they addressed situations of oppression in order to correct them and transform them. Cultural studies has aided and borrowed from all these. Cultural studies is liberally borrowed from feminism, from different forms of environmental criticism, from different systems of class critique, ideology critique. And in India, cultural studies has had a very harmonious connection, especially with Dalit and community critique. And in that sense, how does cultural studies really help in contributing to our understanding of our own lives and transforming them is a question that we need to really ask today. From my limited experience, let me put it limited, my limited experience, my understanding or my impression has been that even while there may be a few exceptions, there are always exceptions. Most cultural studies work today has itself become another methodology, has itself become a reduplication of the earlier systems. There is one dissertation on the comedy films in Malayalam. There is another discussion of comedy films selling in from another angle. A third dissertation, again, about the comic element in Malayalam films. On and on and on. How does it really contribute, or any of them contribute, to our understanding of film culture in Malayalam in the way in which certain dominant ideologies are getting propagated in a fashion where the Malayali film-going public is forcibly removed from an understanding of their own reality and sucked into what one may call a virtual reality of a particular kind of imaginary existence of supposed humor and laughter. How does repeated work of this kind aid in that? Except, of course, in the obtaining of PhDs and MPhils and tenured positions. If cultural studies is original impulse and continuous political intention was a critique of academia, one is sorry to say that vast sections of the cultural studies academia have been sucked into the very academia, the very modalities of that academia, which it tried to resist. And which, in a certain way of speaking, has actually turned cultural studies on its head. This is a major issue as far as academic cultural studies is concerned. At the same time, one cannot deny the fact that cultural studies is not limited to the academia alone. There is work outside, not merely in terms of critical literature, but in terms of original literature too, inspired to a great extent by the, the insights of cultural studies. For Malayalatil Pariyanangil Pradeeban Bambiri Kundinda Edi in the Voliluru Krudi, other novel ano, Sahiti Krudi ano, other Charitram ano, other Kalpida Charitram ano, other Vimarsana Krudi ano. In the Unum Namal Kirtimai Pidida Rade, Pine Sahita Vimarsenathinde, Nisahai the Gonda, the novel in the Viliki game, Pine Matun the Urti Lathu and Vegam, Award Gulu Gurthamunda, the Ripi in Chayinuru, Kirdiana, Pradiban Bamirikun the Dadi, Angani and Palapur Award Uruka, Matun the Urti Linger Award Uru the Pinal Mundandi Kudu, Abangan Award Uru the Munda the Ripikin the Vidi. Iripoli to Kirdida 
സംഗതി ആലോചിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അതിൻ്റെ സ്വഭാവം ആലോചിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ നമ്മൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കുന്നൊരു കാര്യം പ്രദീപൻ വളരെ കൃത്യമായി ദളിത് ഈസ്തറ്റിക്സിൻ്റെയും കൾച്ചർ സ്റ്റഡീസിൻ്റെയും ധാരണകൾ അക്കാഡമിക് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ലെവലിലുള്ള ധാരണകൾ ആർജിച്ചതിൻ്റെ ഫലമായാണ് അത്തരം മൗലികമായൊരു കൃതി എഴുതുവാൻ സാധ്യമായത് എന്ന് തന്നെയാണ് സോ വട്ട് ഐ എം സെയിങ് ഇസ് ഔട്ട് സൈഡ് പ്രദീപൻ അക്കാഡമിക് ആയിരുന്നു പ്രദീപൻ വോസ് അ ടീച്ചർ ഇറ്റ് ശ്രീശങ്കര യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി മച്ച് ബിഫോർ മൈ ടൈം ഐ മീൻ ഈവൻ ദു ഐ ന്യൂ ഹിം പേഴ്സണലി ഓൺ എൻ അതർ ലെവൽ ബട്ട് വാട്ട് യു ഫൈൻഡ് ഇൻ 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 ദോസ് എ ടൈംസ് ഇസ് ദാറ്റ് cultural studies has had implications effects not merely in terms of pedagogy and research but on an entirely different level in terms of creative writing in terms of popular perception in terms of the discourses of everyday life where probably as in the case of feminism today any person with an iota of intelligence will think twice before using the term chairman that is enough at least to a certain extent people are wary about what words to use people even while they may be swearing under their breath they still pay lip service to certain kinds of correctness because they realize it is incorrect to actually use extremely gender objectionable language it is also getting translated in terms of greater awareness even though our media probably will not accept that and will probably glorify or scandalize only those incidents which are the other way around but it is a truth definitely among the younger generation where there is a much greater understanding of gender differences and respect among genders much more so than in the politeness of earlier generations politeness is another form of gender behavior let's let's not go detailed into that but this this way in which cultural studies has impacted popular perceptions popular imagination popular articulation the understanding of people of their own lives of their own social relationships that is there to stay no doubt about that but coming back to academics and intellectual contribution a major question that does become extremely important in this context is has cultural studies at least in india been able to address the actual issue or set of issues which an indian cultural studies scholar should probably be ready to address for this let me go back to history again probably one of the greatest impulses for the formation of the entire theoretical concept the theoretical uh, shall we say uh, the, the the theoretical uh, grouping that became motivational for the creation of the discipline of cultural studies was the frankfurt school the work of the frankfurt school theoreticians such as adorno and horkheimer some of you may be aware of that their article uh, their essay on the cultural industry or people like walter benjamin the age of mechanical reproduction the work of max horkheimer of uh, eric fromm of marcuse and then much later jorgen habermas what were they really concerned with they were primarily concerned with two major problems the first major problem it has nothing to do with academia nothing to do with disciplines it had to do with social life the first major problem that they were really concerned with was the way in which capitalism especially market capitalism and market economy in terms of industrial production and the business concerns and the profit motive which was working at that point of time in a form of classic high capitalism how ideologies were constructed and propagated in order to aid and abet that particular form of social formation for example if you look at culture industry the the essay on cultural industry is it prescribed here is it part of your 
syllabus. It's okay. Yes? Okay. If you look at culture industry, for instance, culture industry is on the one side, you can say it is a Marxist writing, but at the same time, it's very corrective of Marxist approaches. Primarily because if classical Marxism thought of the financial, economic structure of society and the cultural structure of society as distinct and different, and where the economic structure was a primary base structure, and society, social norms, social formations, political structure, and culture were considered the superstructure, secondary in nature, and something which derived its existence from the primary base structure of economy, culture industry brings up an entirely different perspective to it. We are used to looking at culture as a reflection of social life. You look at a text and say, probably your teachers would say, this is a reflection of social reality. One of the novels of, say, uh, I don't know, um, um, Thomas Mann or the novel of Charles Dickens, they might say this is a clear representation or a reflection of the social life of that period. Yes. But what about the making of that text? How is the text itself made? Let me give you a simple example here to make it very clear. Some of you may have heard the work Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Have you? Anyone? Yes. If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, its first edition was very curious. I still remember getting a copy of that first edition, and it was very surprising. So the novel starts in a very, shall we say, exhibitionist manner, where the novel, novelist seems to be telling you, you are about to start Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Suddenly you stop, you look back and think, okay, who is this telling me this? I know, but the novel, novelist seems to be telling me, you're about to start reading Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. You have been hearing about the publication of this book. You've read about it in the newspapers. You've heard about it being spoken by your friends. And then you realize that it has been published, so you go to a bookshop to buy that. And when you go into the bookshop, you find the first shelf completely filled with books which you have read and you don't want to buy. The next shelf, you have piles of books which you have always claimed to have read but never really read. Books which you never wanted to read. Books which you said, which you only read partly, but in your discourses with friends claim to have read fully. Books you have bought and kept at home but never got into reading and so on and so forth. It's a set of classifications of books, every one of them puncturing the vanity of the reader. This is a vanity that we all have, let us be honest. Anyway, so in that way, there's a classification, taxonomy of books, one after the other. Finally, the, he says, the, the book says, you finally found, you found a winter's night a traveler. And you go with the book to the counter. You have, you're buying the book from the counter where you meet another lady there. That is when you realize that this you that is being mentioned in that first chapter is not really you, but there is another you within the novel. It's part of the novel. It apparently seems to be speaking to this reader, but really speaking, it is speaking to a reader within the book itself. And so there is reader one and there is reader two who has bought the other book. And so naturally one is male, the other is female. There is a little bit of interest between them. So they, he starts, this reader starts and gets into uh, the, the, the bus. And because the book is just bought, he's very curious. So you don't get a seat. You're sitting, you're standing in the, in the, on the bus, and you're holding the rail above. 
but you're so curious, you want to read this book, you slowly try to get it out of the wrapper while still holding on to the rail there and start to open it so that you can start reading the beginning. Then you ask, wonder, what is this book that we are reading now? There is a book which is being spoken of inside this book, but we are reading this book about reading that book. Okay, but the stop arrives, you cannot, you, the bus arrives at the stop, so you can't read, you go back. You sit in your, in your, in your library, and you are about to read, then you suddenly realize there is a TV on in the next room, I don't want to be disturbed. So you go in, close the, the door, lock it, and come back and sit and realize if someone comes and knocks, you'll have to get up and go and open it. So you get up and open it and then keep it ajar and sits down to read, suddenly realizes, what if I want to have a drink of water while I'm in the process of reading? So you get up and go get a glass of water and keep it there. Then why not put a cushion behind your back? Goes through all this and finally starts reading. And then the chapter ends there and another thing starts. And what starts is a story. And it says, if on a night, that's all. That is the title of that chapter or whatever section you call it. And that title and that story is a very, very intensely gripping story. And the story is to do with two people, one person who has come to a railway station on a train, and he has got a suitcase in his hand. And he's supposed to get down on that station, and another train will come in half an hour's time. Another person will get off that train, and the two of them will walk against each other, apparently inadvertently collide against each other, both will drop their suitcases, one will pick up the other suitcase and go their separate ways and go by the trains that were to come later. Now we understand this must be a conspiracy, this must be spies, this could be something to do with a crime organization, all that and all that. So this man arrives there with the suitcase only to find that the person who's supposed to collide with that person's train has already come and gone. So he's left with the suitcase, having no idea what to do with it, walking up and down the, st the, the train station. He goes into the pub next, into the, into the pub on the, on, the, on the station platform, and there he walks straight into, I don't want to go into details, he walks straight into uh, Ménage à Troy, almost, where there is a mayor, the police chief, and uh, a lady, she was the wife of one person and she is a paramour of the uh, police chief right now. There is huge tension among them. And the police chief, just as he comes in, just walks by this man and says, you better get out of here fast. So things become very intense. And at one point, you just turn the page as you would turn in any book. There is, in that edition, it was done perfectly. At the end, there is a sentence midway here. You turn the page and you find chapter two. So you turn back again and it's the same. There is a, it's the middle of a sentence. You turn again, it's chapter two again. So what's happened? You are held there. It's like a climatic point in the story. It's not going forward. There is a break and there is chapter two here. And you wonder, you start looking back, you start looking from the beginning again, one, two, three, four, five, six. It has come through 16 pages, but then the net, the, you turn over and it's the first uh, chapter two again. And chapter two tells you that this is what has happened to that book. The person who started reading this book in the first chapter, as he was going through the book, he went through 16 pages, and then when he turned, what he found was that it was the first page of that book repeated again. So he goes through that and he finds that, again, 16 pages. Again, back to number one. One to 16, one to 16, one to 16, repeated again and again and again. Can you imagine why this has happened? Anyone?
In the conventional old form of offset printing, printing is done on a forum. One side is eight pages, the other side is eight pages. Anyone who's familiar with printing will know this. Eight pages on one side, eight pages on the other side. If you fold it properly and cut it, you will have one to 16 pages in one forum. The next forum will be 17 to 32. The third forum will be 33 to uh, 16, 48, or whatever. It'll go like that. When you bind a book, what you do is you take forum one, forum two, forum three like that, and bind them together. What has happened in this case is that the first forum itself has been bound together. And so the book doesn't go anywhere. Now what happens here, you curse the writer, honestly, because you've reached a point where you yourself want to go forward and know what is happening in the story. And the reader inside the novel is also very angry. But what it shows us is that the book is not just a set of ideas. The book is a physical object produced in an industrial fashion, printed in a press, bound in a certain fashion, brought together in a certain fashion as a physical object. You never think of a book as a physical object, but it is a physically produced object. And that book, at that point, you're suddenly made to realize how a book is printed, bound, etc. that particular industrial or technical process by which it is done, you realize that the book is not just a cultural object, the book is also a commercial product. The book is produced, so to speak. Now, why I'm saying is this, what culture industry, that SEO and culture industry does, is to question the division between the financial economic structure and the cultural structure and see culture itself as ultimately economic in nature. Television, operas, films, etc. They are fundamentally economic activities. And because they are economic activities, culture is structured, determined, and coordinated in a fashion that has got clear economic principles working through them. It is not just that culture reflects or represents reality or society, but culture is itself society. Culture is itself economy, so to speak. This was one side that they were looking at. The other side that they looked at, they had to look at, was inspired or was occasioned by the fact that they were living at a time when Nazism was rising. Nazism in the form of the National Socialist Party created by Hitler, and where every form of oppression was meted out to the Jews, and a military state was created where absolute totalitarianism that is centered, that was centered upon the single party of the Nationalist Socialist, and where there was the culture of freer created among everyone at large. What they were looking at at that point of time was how, even when it was clear that there was implicit and explicit violence of the highest degree in the work of the National Socialists, even when it was clear that people were disappearing with the midnight knock on the door, even when it was clear that this was a dictatorship or a totalitarian state, why was it that the people of Germany accepted it, celebrated it, even supported it completely, and became part and parcel of that entire bandwagon of totalitarianism? It's a very serious question an extremely serious question that they posed. There was a book written by Erika Mann, the daughter of Thomas Mann, called Schooling, School for Barbarians, where she speaks at length about the way in which the educational system of Germany was completely changed, completely transformed, in order to create a locale for the propagation of the Nazi ideology through fear, through mistrust, through methods 
of spying, conspiracy, etc., where it reached a point where children in schools would actually carry tales about their own parents, people in their own family, so that these parents and these family members could be arrested by the Nazis so that they could be celebrated and facilitated and given, uh, shall we say, awards or different forms of prizes. What Adorno and Horkheimer, and especially Walter Benjamin, wanted to ask and tried to ask was how such a climate of authoritarianism, of totalitarianism, could be established with the active compliance and connivance of the population at large. How could it be that the German population, who were the possessors of one of the greatest traditions of literature and art and culture, could be party to the mass decimation of millions of Jews, where they could stand by and watch without horror to the actual fact that the family next door could disappear the next day and they wouldn't ask a question. The number of people who died in concentration camps on the way to concentration camps, the ways in which they were killed, either through starvation or through uh, you know, mass shootings, I mean, different ways. It was a killer regime. And that killer regime was supported by the entire population, or the majority of the population. How is it that civilization or enlightenment could actually turn it to its very opposite, the very contrary of what it originally purported to be? How is it that, and they saw it as a crisis of Western civilization. How is it that Western civilization, which considered itself to superior to every other civilization, be home to the most horrendous crime that humanity has ever seen. This was a question that the Frankfurt School really addressed in their theories. This was the idea that came up repeatedly, again and again and again in their work. This was a problem that in a certain manner of speaking, the successors of the Frankfurt School, they all were plagued by, they all had to address. I don't know whether I should say anything more about India. We live in a climate now which is remarkably similar to what happened in Germany. Remarkably similar. What is happening here is a construction of a culture of hate. The institutionalization of hatred and the celebration of a culture of violence that is born from that. It has become the new normal. Look at your WhatsApp messages, your WhatsApp group messages, etc. Look at the social media. Look at our mass media. Do you think it would have been possible for you to believe that 10 years back, if you were told that this would be the nature of our media 10 years hence, do you think you would have believed this? It is so easy for certain communities to be demonized. It is so easy to be angry and hateful and use the most impossibly obscene language, violent language, to anyone you think is your opponent. If media is supposed to bring you together, here is media which is separating you, but not just separating you, creating hordes within you, creating marauding hordes among you who can kill, maim at will at the switch of a button, which will be the click of a mobile phone. I hope what I'm saying is clear to you. What has cultural studies got to say about that? How many of our scholars have really addressed this issue? We are busy looking at fashion. We are busy looking at different forms of cultural discourse, yes. But why is it that this most pressing, this most immediate, this most, shall I say, compelling question that we can ever really ask 
Why is it that we fear to ask that? Why is it that we fear to address that? That is my complaint against cultural studies today. I understand that cultural studies, especially in Kerala and in the rest of India, has done momentous work, no doubt, momentous work from the standpoints of feminism, from the standpoints of Dalit critique, from the standpoints of caste and community, no doubt. None of them can be denied. In fact, they should be acknowledged. But why do we shy away from the most important question that we should probably be asking? The most important question that we should probably be addressing? To this end, let me just quote, and I shall finish with that. Let me just quote a little piece from Adorno's and uh, <clears throat> Horkheimer's Dialectic of Enlightenment, where faced with the most horrendous crime that was unfolding in front of their eyes, and unable to confront it or change it, they were asked, they had to ask themselves what they could do. And this was one of the answers that Adorno came up with. The only philosophy which can be responsibly practiced in face of despair is the attempt to contemplate all things as they would present themselves from the standpoint of redemption. Let me repeat that. The only philosophy which can be responsibly practiced in the face of despair, when hope is impossible, when there doesn't seem to be any way in which you can actually serve yourself from this imminent catastrophe, in front of the despair, there is only one philosophy that is possible. That is the attempt to contem contemplate all things as they would present themselves from the standpoint of redemption, that after this, there is something to come. That after this, there is a possibility of saving ourselves, saving what we wear, that after this, we can redeem ourselves. There is a strong Christian or a Judaic or a Hebrew, Hebraic sense there of redemption. Rakshagara dharmam of redeeming yourself, how to redeem yourself of your sins. You can only look at whatever you see around, probably not in a manner of facing and overcoming them today, but there is a tomorrow that shall come. And if you would want that tomorrow not to judge you badly, you need to think of redeeming yourself in terms of that future. Can cultural studies do that, is my question. Thank you. Thank you very much.